Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. I'll try to keep these comments brief. Thank you. Uh, my name is Josh Golden. I am uh, Senior Vice President of Strategy with Capital RX. Um, if you'll permit me, I'd like to just take a minute and explain my background, which may help to explain why I'm standing here in the first place. I spent the last 20 years as a consultant uh, to some of the largest health plan sponsors in the United States. This includes Fortune 500 companies, labor unions, government entities, uh, state municipalities, state government programs, et cetera. I helped them navigate the uh, often murky waters of the pharmacy benefit landscape. So I helped with uh, managed procurement processes to help them select PBMs. Uh, I helped them negotiate PBM contracts, uh, helped them implement with PBMs, and ultimately helped them audit PBMs after they were implemented. I only explain this because it provided me with a pretty unique window into the inner workings of the typical PBM business model. Uh, respectfully, I would argue there's probably a few dozen people in the United States that could accurately describe how PBMs make money and uh, would be willing to stand up and speak publicly about it. Uh, I happen to be one of those people, uh, and so I just wanted to offer up my perspectives and my expertise as you all work hard to deliberate this, um, this extremely important piece of legislation. Um, so about my company, uh, Capital RX is technically a PBM, uh, but we are by no means a typical PBM. Uh, we uh, stand here today in support of, um, of House Bill 946. Our company is based on a simple principle, and that is that in order for a PBM to act in the best interests of patients and plan sponsors, the relationship must be both aligned and transparent. And now when I talk about alignment, it's pretty simple. There should be no conflict of interest in the PBM's business model. When I talk about transparency, and that word is often you know, sort of bantered about in this industry, uh, my definition is pretty simple. Every drug should have a price. That price should be the same for everyone that's involved in the transaction, and it should be easy to validate. Now, unfortunately, the vast majority of PBMs in the industry are neither aligned or transparent. Um, most of them derive profit from a, a vast array of complex and opaque financial arrangements uh, that extend up and down the supply chain. Uh, it would take me about an hour to go into all the details of those types of arrangements. I'd be happy to do so, but I know we don't really have time for that today. Uh, but I think that some of the speakers have touched on some of the most um, significant sources of indirect profitability that PBMs enjoy. Uh, they use proprietary price lists, which are often called MAC lists, maximum allowable cost lists, to manipulate the price of drugs within the retail environment, extracting margin and profitability with, with, with a high level of precision. Uh, they steer patients towards uh, profitable uh, dispensing assets like mail order pharmacies, specialty pharmacies, uh, even when those patients might be able to obtain those same therapies at a lower cost elsewhere. Um, and they quietly retain hundreds of millions of dollars in rebates from pharmaceutical companies. Thankfully, the media uh, and uh, forward-thinking government officials such as yourselves are starting to shine a light into the black box of the PBM business model. Uh, Capital RX may be the only PBM that's willing to stand up and say, yes, let's shine that light as bright as we can. Let's explore the PBM business model. Let's unearth it. Let's identify those aspects within it that represent a conflict of interest to the plan sponsor or the patient, or that impede the free market competition of drug prices within the US. And to the extent that we find aspects of the business model that do that, let's get rid of them. Let's replace them with mechanisms that support free market capitalism, free market price competition, and that align the interests of the PBMs with the folks they're supposed to be representing and working for. I wanted to uh, applaud uh, the uh, authors of this particular legislation, HB 946, in general uh, for the efforts that they're uh, making now to increase transparency in the industry. But I wanted to call out, if, if I may, a couple of uh, aspects of the bill that we're particularly supportive of as an organization. Again, this makes us a bit of a unique animal within the PBM industry, um, but this is what we stand for as an organization. Uh, number one, that a plan sponsor should be charged the same price that a pharmacy is reimbursed. This to me is simple. It's at the heart of our business a model at, as a PBM. Anything short of that simple truth, anything short of that is going to allow the PBM to act as a price manipulator within the supply chain. And once they're in that position of power, they can extract margin. It's as simple as that. 
Uh, just as simple as the notion of passing through 100% of rebates. Uh, Mr. Woods, one of the prior uh, presenters here, mentioned that PBMs pass through a portion of rebates, 90%, um, and that they retain in general about 10%. I would argue with that statistic. I think a lot of that boils down to how you define rebates. When we casually refer to rebates, those are actually a myriad of revenue streams. I'm not going to get into the details, uh, but they extend far beyond rebates at this point and include other revenue streams that are largely retained by the PBM, again, quietly and without, in many cases, without the awareness of the patient or the plan sponsor. So the argument is always made, I think, by the, by the traditional PBMs, well, okay, so what? If that's how we make money to support our business model, it allows us to charge a lower administrative fee to the plan sponsor. And while that may be true, I would argue that the moment a PBM begins to retain rebate dollars as profitability, then they have, uh, they have entered into an area of conflict of interest. Those are conflict dollars. And I'll use an example to explain how this can uh, how this can play out within the real world. For the best example of this, we really need to look no further than a, a drug called Duexis. Uh, it is a drug that is a brand name patent protected drug. It was released a few years ago. I'm seeing some nods in the audience. I bet that you may start to hear the collective groan of a few pharmacists who know what this drug is. It is comprised of two active ingredients, both of which are available in OTC form. It is basically Pepsid AC plus Advil. Merge together into a single pill for convenience, slap a new color on it, and the price of that drug, if anyone wants to guess, I don't have the AWP handy, uh, it is north of $2,000 for that prescription. Now, <clears throat> I heard both uh, Mr. Wethington and Mr. Woods say, uh, in one form or fashion, that PBMs exist to address the rising cost of pharmaceuticals. Um, and, and, you know, I certainly applaud that. But if a PBM's job is to help their clients manage pharmaceutical costs, what PBM in their right mind would promote a drug like Duexis over the widely available over-the-counter alternatives that cost together $20 a month? Uh, well, you may be surprised to learn that most large national PBMs have at one time or another included Duexis on their formulary, actively steering patients towards this product. And why do they do this? Well, because Duexis, with its price tag north of $2,000, uh, also has a rebate on the back end. Now, we don't know what this rebate is, because that's subject to the veil of secrecy that PBMs maintain over rebates. But we do have a guess. We think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 70, 80 percent of the drug cost. And of course, the PBM is permitted to retain a portion of that rebate. The end result is that plant, and by the way, this is just one example of a, a product that I would consider to be waste in the system that could easily be eradicated if incentives were better aligned. The end result is that plan sponsors and taxpayers are paying billions of dollars for these and other wasteful products every year at the encouragement of the PBM who's actively steering patients towards these products because they have a, a profit stake in the outcome. Um, I will mention uh, steering because I also, we as an organization also agree that it is a conflict of interest for a PBM to own a dispensing asset and actively steer members, patients towards that dispensing aspect, a, asset for profit. I, in my mind uh, and in the mind of our organization, I think many like-minded individuals here, uh, vendors need to decide what they want to do. Do they want to serve the best interests of plan sponsors and help them manage cost and help them manage health outcomes? Or do they want to profit off of the dispensing of expensive pharmaceutical products? I think you could do either of these things without an inherent conflict of interest. But the moment you attempt to do both of those things simultaneously, the conflict is obvious and it's inevitable. I wanted to call out again, if you'll permit me, permit me one or two more moments, uh, I wanted to call out the use of NADAC or NADAC as a reference benchmark for pricing. I know that we're, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the bill has uh, experienced some changes as it relates to this particular uh, provision, but I did want to applaud in general the movement towards NADAC as a more rational index for monitoring, tracking, and benchmarking drug prices. Um, we believe very strongly in this. There are many PBMs out there who would argue that this can't be done, that AWP, average wholesale price, and MAC lists that they manage is the way it's always been done, and that's the way it always needs to be done, that that's the only plausible way of managing drug cost. 
Um, well, uh, we've got news for you. Capital RX last year recontracted our entire retail network using a NADAC reimbursement model, similar to many state Medicaid programs. So to those that say it can't be done, we've got over 60,000 retail pharmacies in our network that would argue otherwise. Um, some comments were made about NADAC that I want to just touch on briefly. Mr. Wethington mentioned that, you know, under NADAC, dispensing fees are higher, uh, and I will acknowledge that. A dispensing fee under a typical PBM arrangement using AWP is somewhere in the neighbor of, in neighborhood of a dollar, a dollar fifty. Uh, now again, I'll, I'll kind of, I'm not a dispensing pharmacist, but I know that there are a few in the room. I would look to them to ask whether they feel that that's an appropriate reimbursement for the service of preparing the prescription, dispensing it, and advising or guiding the patient. Obviously, we know that is a subsidized fee. That fee is subsidized by some unknown margin that's built into ingredient cost. So yes, under a NADAC reimbursement, the dispensing fee is higher, but the ingredient cost reimbursement is far lower. And the total cost ends up being lower in the aggregate. And we have results that can prove that across our 46 clients that have joined our organization. Now, Mr. Wethington also suggested that we extend transparency, this notion of transparency, up and down the supply chain to include other players. And I think we agree, a NADAC reimbursement pharmacies because it gets their dispensing costs out on the table, where we can understand it's out on the table, where we can understand what it is, and then begin to negotiate towards the lowest net cost. Now, I've got a number of other uh, elements I'd be happy to talk about, but I probably should pause here because I've been speaking for quite a while, and I'll, I guess I'll defer to the committee on any questions at this point. We do. Are any, any questions from the committee members at this point? Um, if there is a quick summary you, you want to give, that'd be fine, or if you're at a good stopping point. We I mean, I will only some... say again that I, uh, I applaud the authors of the bill uh, for bringing about uh, this important issue, uh, bringing it to light. Uh, uh, again, kudos to the committee and, uh, and the and the, uh, the uh, you know the the um, house as a whole for considering this. We are highly supportive of this legislation. We are proof positive that a aligned PBM business model can work and can drive outcomes for patients and plan sponsors. I will say that for those plan to to the point that was made around a transparent PBM model potentially increasing costs. For plan sponsors and patients, we have anecdotal evidence otherwise of the clients that have moved to our transparent platform. They have experienced savings of approximately 13% year over year from their prior traditional PBM model. Um, so I'd be happy to share that evidence with, uh, with anyone that's interested. But again, thank you very much for the opportunity to share my, my thoughts, uh, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank you for your contributions. We've, I know we had a, that's all, thank you. Yeah. 